Hello and welcome to the CEO Show. I am your host Nick Vadia and I bring to you today an incredibly inspiring story of Dr. Ernst Volgano, who started a company in his basement after retirement and made it into a Fortune 1000 company and amongst the top 100 companies to work for. Before getting ranked amongst the Fortune 1000 companies, Volgano's SRA International was also ranked amongst the Inc. 500 companies for four years in a row. So Ernst has tremendous lessons to share and in the conversation that follows, he reveals the core principles that he attributes his success to. So ladies and gentlemen, here's Dr. Ernst Wagner for you. Ernst, welcome to the CEO show. I really appreciate your time and uh, your insights that we are going to get into. Thank you. Ernst, what's very inspiring about you is you started a company in your garage after retiring. It's like the KFC guy. And, and you took it to a Fortune 1000 company. That is an amazing feat for someone who's retired and says, well, what, what do I do next? Let me go ahead and start a company and make it a Fortune 1000 company. Right. Well, first of all, uh, Nick, I started the company in my basement, not my garage. My garage is far too cold in northern Virginia for that. And, uh, and retirement is a term of art because I spent 20 years in the Air Force and I was able to retire in that sense. I never planned on a permanent retirement that young. I was only 41 or 42 at the time. So uh, I knew I was going to do something. But in terms of building the company, I had been thinking about it for almost a decade before then, and before I left the Air Force, retired, if you want to call it that, uh, and so I knew what I was going to do, and, and I had a plan. I was ready to go. Well, um, and I, I guess you leveraged your background in the Air Force. Uh, you, you got your PhD while being in the services and uh, also your master's. But you were, an, you were a pilot. Is that correct? No, uh, actually, I, I got my pr – that was a source of great frustration to me because I very much wanted to fly. And, but my eyesight wasn't good enough, and that plagued me throughout my career. Turned out okay, but uh, the Air Force sent me to get a master's and a PhD, as you pointed out, in electrical engineering, and uh, that's exactly where I wanted to be, and uh, I am very thankful that uh, my country helped me get where I am today. Now, one thing I've noticed is in talking to some people, and I talked to the chairman of CACI, one of your competitors as well, uh, there's something that you learn in the forces, in the services, that uh, seems to be consistent. I've talked to three or four uh, highly successful people who have created civilian careers that are really, really top-notch. And they all talk about the lessons they learned in the military or the Navy or the Air Force. And uh, what were your foundations? Where did you get your foundations from? Well, I, I had a good family to begin with. My father served in the South Pacific during World War II. He was one of my heroes, probably my primary hero. And so I, I wanted to go into the military. My bro older brother Coleman served in the Marines. Uh, he didn't see any action. He was too young, but he enlisted in the Marines during World War II. And, uh, the, the military and the sense of serving our country uh, was always foremost in our family. And so it, I was destined to go to a, a service academy. Turns out that I went into the Naval Academy and uh, from there into the Air Force, but that's another story. And the sense of high ethics and commitment to service to our country and to world society uh, has certainly always been prominent in my mind. Now, I want to ask you one question. I, I noticed that when I made certain statements that were slightly incorrect, not terribly like garage versus basement. Now, when you correct me and say, no, it was the basement, not garage, that demonstrates a characteristic trait of an individual who says, wait a sec, I am not going to go for what's inaccurate. Most people would let it fly because it's the same thing. But this demonstrates a particular behavior pattern. And most people think that, you know, for success, you need not be ethical. You need not, not, that's not what I'm saying, that most people, some people think that 
you know, these are, these are important values to have, but they don't have any relationship with success. What's your take on that? Well, early on, very early in the beginning of my company, SRA International, I called my executives together and uh, I said, uh, what do we stand for? What are Im the important things in our lives, our professional lives? And we all agreed, it may surprise some people, but making money was not one of them. It's not high on the list. What was high on the list was ethical performance, serving our customers well, taking care of our people, and serving uh, society as a whole. And that became the basis for our motto or our theme or ethic, which is honesty and service. And at the time, we didn't talk about building the business. Of course, we all wanted a successful business, but we were surprised to learn retrospectively that honesty and service was a principal factor in our success. And the reason it was is that really capable people, many of them, want to work for an organization that stands for something. Sure, they want to get paid well, they want to do useful work in their specialty, but working for a company that stands something really told a difference for us. Because in our field, information technology, it's very hard to recruit capable people. There's the demand has more or less always exceeded the supply. And we found that that one factor allowed us to attract good people, very capable people in the beginning, and to keep them once they were here, once they joined us. You know, th this, this uh, concept that you just talked about actually resonates with uh, a lot of successful companies, whether they are Inc. 500 or the Fortune 500 companies. I have talked to a lot of CEOs. In fact, uh, one of the persons I talked just about before I talked with you is a person by the name Rohit Mahalotra, Mahalotra and he is the CEO of a small company, but the fastest growing IT company of year 2014. And he said exactly the same thing, the mission. You've got to define your mission, and it is mostly not money, but if it is money, that's fine too. However, once you define a mission, everybody coalesces around it, everybody's energized around the mission, they, if they buy into that mission. So depending upon how we define our mission, that leads you forward. So, so success of a company is then perhaps more dependent upon uh, the, the focus. It doesn't matter what focus. That's what I'm uh, conjecturing right now, that as long as you have a tight focus on something, uh, you're likely to succeed as opposed to what the focus is. You could have easily chosen to be like, I mean, you, you perhaps wouldn't, but somebody could have chosen to be like Enron, would have been successful, eventually failed, but is that one of the things that you would say that the tight focus is important or is it also important what you focus on? Well, certainly a, a very sharp fo focus is important. And we always were focused on business success. It's just that our ethic, honesty and service doesn't address business success. The business success we found flowed from that ethic. But close behind that, was the fact that we would grow our revenue and, and our profit. Because idealism by itself would be academic if we were not a business success. On the other hand, being a business success meant that in some sense, and I say this with humility, we always wanted to serve as a good model for free enterprise around the world. And I think we are. So to the extent that we are not a business success, we're not, in that sense, fulfilling our ethic of honesty and service. The, the result was that in the 1980s, we were on the ink list of fastest growing privately held companies for four years in a row. And then later on, we had a successful IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. As a matter of fact, it was the sixth most successful initial public offering. 
and we grew very, very well uh, for years, and our stock soared. And all of that was because of our focus on honesty and service and business success. So in a certain sense, you know, the focus is critical, but at the same time, if the focus is on something or certain value or a principle that is uh, desirable by the market, as well as consistent with your and aligned with your own personalities and thinking, then you serve your organizations, uh, your own organization, as well as other businesses that you that are your clients or prospective clients. So that alignment makes a difference. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it, it is, and I can give you one or two anecdotes. I have many more than you'd probably like to hear, but uh, for example, uh, at one time, uh, well, first of all, we're a services organization. We're not a product company. So the more services we get, if we're performing them well, uh, the more we grow and the, and the more our profit grows. And from time to time, and this has happened several times in our history, our customer has said, okay, you did a good job on, on preparing, let us say, this software or building an IT system. You did a good job there. We've got this new idea, and we'd like to give you some money to pursue it. And we took a look at the new idea. And frankly, it wasn't a wise thing for them to do. It was a waste of money. And we told them so. And so we didn't get the work. But we did get their confidence. And in getting their confidence, we got even more work in the long run. So the idea of focus and integrity and the interaction, interplay between the two, we have found it was really quite interesting and, and productive in the most positive, healthy sense. Now, this is very interesting. This is something that, uh, you know, they don't teach in business school specifically as a paradigm saying that, you know, you need to define your mission and your core principles and core, core values. I mean, this country has been immensely successful because of its constitution, because of the foresight of its founding forefathers and uh, the Bill of Rights. That's something you don't change. Everything else is around it. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why this country is successful. In the similar way, you, you're saying that a company also needs to have sort of a constitution and underlying set of principles. In, indeed. In, and in fact, uh, we think that, the, that our country uh, is an inspiration for free democracy throughout the world. Sure, we have our defects, but there's always a desire to correct them. You see in the release of the uh, so-called torture information uh, right. by the Senate uh, today, that, that's an example. It's painful, but it's salubrious. And, and we in, in SRA had these same uh, similar problems, analogous problems, not the same, but analogous problems. We have our defects. We made mistakes. But... Uh, we have in the culture that flowed from honesty and service, the ideas, the, the, the concept that the best ideas win. And that means that anybody in the company who disagrees with me or the CEO or someone else can feel free to argue with us about it. And we're not a committee, but we listen and we debate the approach uh, constructively. So you create that cultural environment that is consistent with the mission and the purpose uh, and the values that you have set for the company. Now, oftentimes when uh, companies grow, uh, there is chaos and you've grown, you know, being in the Inc. 500 companies, you, you know that. And the culture gets diluted or sometimes even lost. Yes. What are the things that you have done in your life to inculcate that culture and to make sure that it survives? Well, uh, sometimes the culture, is, the, the culture is tested at various times. And uh, in our case, I retired as CEO in 2005. And, and we, hired a new, we appointed a new CEO, a very capable person. Uh, 
uh, who served us well for two and a half years, but he wanted to retire. Then we hired another person. The point is that the transition uh, uh, of the CEO, CEOs, plural, was difficult for us. And, and we encountered some business difficulties as a result. And unfortunately for us, the market became uh, gradually worse during that period. So we went through that transition uh, and our business suffered. The rapid growth declined. Uh, we were no longer leading the pack from a business standpoint uh, without discussing the issue of, of uh, ethics. Uh, and that made, that threatened our ethical and cultural framework. And eventually, uh, and we were a public company at the time, which made it even more difficult. And eventually, we decided, the board decided to sell the company. So we, we became owned by a private equity firm. Part, part of that deal was I had to roll over some of my stock. So I'm still an owner of our company. So that was another transition. And we hired still another CEO. And we had to try to restore the framework that we had gradually lost. It wasn't any, you can't blame anybody for all of it. It just happened over a series of personalities. So that has been an interesting, but at the same time trying experience. And so we're in the process of revitalizing the firm. We've got a dynamic uh, young CEO by the name of Bill Ballhouse, who is leading us back. And one of his major issues or initiatives is to restore the ethic in the full sense of the word of honesty and service and at the same time be inspirational original in the work that we do that's very interesting so these challenges that you faced of uh, losing the path a little bit and then trying to course correct and this is a normal course of of a company or an executive these are challenges that we do face so in the process of creating this culture and recreating the culture, what are some of the critical steps that you would take when you saw these challenges? You know, how do you go through them? It must have been emotionally difficult and so on and so forth. I just want to get a sense of, you know, what was the thought process that you went through and what were the learnings that you discovered? Uh, well, I, the, the, first of all, uh, it's important, perhaps interesting to note that we went through a series of phases that most companies don't go through all those phases as many as we did in more than 35 years there was startup and survival there was rapid growth with a closely held uh, company there was the ipo and the public company there were the transition dif difficulties associated as a public company. And then there was a buyout uh, by a private equity firm. Very few people uh, go through that. And uh, I had the good fortune just to happen to have lived that long <laughs> to experience all of those things. So when you ask me a question about how did you deal with those difficulties, I, I, my answer is I tried to see what could be learned from all of those experiences over all of those years? And so working with some of my colleagues, I codified them in 30 business lessons. And those business lessons weren't embedded in just one company, let's say a closely held, fast going, privately, uh, 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 private company, but they were embedded in all these other phases as well. So it's very difficult to answer in general uh, your question about how I dealt with all those difficulties. And people say to me, well, geez, 30 lessons, that's a lot to cope with uh, for you know somebody who's trying to learn the lesson and, and do what you did that was right, but not make your mistakes. 
So I, I boiled them down to about five or six. And, uh, and even the five or six sound a little bit superficial, a little bit obvious. But those five or six lessons, I'll give you a couple of examples uh, in a minute, but those five or six lessons are very hard to do. If everybody could do them, if everybody would conform them well, we'd have a bunch of successful companies. But we don't. And the reason we don't is because they're hard to perform. Let me give you an example. Hiring good people. That would be number one on the list. And, and, and I mentioned the fact that good people were attracted to our ethic, but, but we had to have other ways of, of attracting and retaining them. And what happens is when you're growing fast, your levels, I'll say bureaucracy, but that's got a bad connotation. Your levels of management increase. They have to. And during the first several years, I interviewed everybody who came in the company because I knew that I wanted to hire the very best people. And, uh, and the reason I, I got that example from a job I had in the Pentagon as a military officer in the late 1960s. I was in an organization called the Whiz Kids. It was the most competent group of people that I've ever run across before or since. There were uh, numerous PhDs, uh, often in quantitative subjects. There were Rhodes Scholars, and there were people that had made other achieve achievements in academia. Now, I said to myself, if I ever get in an organization, I'm going to hire a bunch of people like that. It was very hard to hire a bunch of people like that. For example, you don't want everybody who is a complete super academic superstar. We use the term one feather braves. Uh, a one feather brave is never going to be a chief, but he or she can do very good work and make a contribution to the company. So we wanted to have one feather braves. But the problem is, as these management layers increased, I found that sometimes people weren't even hiring one feather braves. Uh, an, an example is, uh, perhaps not a good one, but people frequently uh, hire to fill a specific billet, a specific specialty. But then when that job is finished in a services organization, they lay off those people. Well, laying off people to us is an anathema. We hate to do it. Another example is a, a supervisor who is under pressure to get a job staff because the customer is demanding it. And the person, and, and they skim through the reference checks. Well, people, in their references are always going to list their friends and their friends are mainly going to give them good references and there's not that kind of critical examination of people so we got some people that weren't really qualified into the firm by mistake not by intent but by mistake that's an example of how hard it is to hire really good people but at the same time, it is a critical factor for success. So really the quintessential seed underlying uh, all of this in terms of success uh, seems to boil down to, again, the core values, uh, which does include discipline and uh, you know the, the idea of ethics and morality, whatever you call that, also includes the concept of discipline, that doing what you must do. First, you decide what you must do and then doing it, walking the talk. And that's the hardest part. Anyone can say, well, to lose weight, you need to exercise and eat right. Um, yeah, pretty simple. There are lots of books. Everybody talks about lots of magazine articles that your calorie intake has to be equal to what your needs are. But it's very, very hard to implement it. Yes. In that sense, what you're saying is that the discipline of doing things is is really the quintessential element of success, one of them. And the other one is knowing what your principles are or what your values are. Yes. Uh, corporate self-discipline is very important. And so, it's, not, it's not that people are intentionally 
uh, not not doing their jobs. They just get overwhelmed by other things. They've got to meet, make a deliverable. They got to stay profitable. They got to get new work. And oh, by the way, they've got to hire people. Yeah, and they're competing they priorities, hire. competing deadlines, and in, in, in the balance of priorities and deadlines, uh, that's where lies the skill of a leader. That you know when to do what. Yes. So how do you handle those challenges when you are extremely stressed out? And I don't even know if you get stressed out because there are some great leaders who are very nonchalant. It's like, you know, it is a stressor, but I don't have to be stressed. Are you one of those or, or do you have tricks to handle your stress? Well, uh, you're asking a type A impatient person whether or not he gets stressed. Yes, I get stressed. Uh, because inevitably there are formidable challenges in a job like I have had. Not so much now, but in a job like I used to have. And uh, I had one rule that helped me, and that is I noticed that you do most of your worst worrying at night. You wake up in the middle of the night and, uh, and you're worried about a specific subject. And I said, I'm not going to do that. But it's hard not to do. So my little trick was the fact that as an engineer, I took many math courses. I could do the math, but I never really understood and accepted the concepts. There were just some questions in mathematics that that worried me and I was so busy, so stressed trying to get my PhD that in a limited amount of time which the Air Force offered me that uh, I never got to really study mathematics, which is hard for me just like it is for many other people in the kind of detail. So I got a book on advanced mathematics for engineers and scientists and I said I'm going to go through this book and I'm going to study some of these concepts. And so I'd open that book and I'd read a concept on something else, something or other. And then I'd close the book and I'd lie back and I'd say, gee, I wonder what they mean meant by that. And pretty soon I went to sleep. And the reason I could consistently do that is because mathematics was interesting to me, but in my job at the time, it wasn't particularly important. Well, the company's survival was vital at that time, and I don't want, didn't want to think about the company's survival at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so that, that's how I helped relieve my, my stress, and I combined that with, with workouts, which I've done since, since being at the Naval Academy. And so I had good exercise, and mostly, most of all, I have a great wife of 55 years and a great family, three wonderful daughters, and so I have my family. So I have that kind of stability uh, in my life. Now, this is wonderful. This, these, these are some amazing statements because coming from you, it makes more sense how to distract yourself because ultimately our mind is actually in, an instrument. And oftentimes the chemicals throw us off, which is what stressors are. And then it takes you into a spiral downwards and you've got to put a stop to it. Uh, some people do meditation, others may do exercise, somebody else might do mathematics. Uh, Bill Gates apparently carries a boatload of completely unrelated books that he reads. So, so you, you basically manage yourself, self-management by saying, okay, I need to get this problem solved. I don't need to be stressed out. Today, I have had enough. I'm going to go do something else. And yes. uh, that's, that's very, very powerful. So what about failures? Uh, I'm sure you've experienced failures. Do you think that failures are more important to learn from than success? Or what's your take on it? And can you share with us some of your failures? Well, certainly failures uh, are constructive in the learning process if you treat them as so. If, if you regard a failure as an inherent deficiency in you and the company that can't be corrected, then that's a, not a good situation. Uh, when we had failures, and there were many, uh, we would talk about them, not as an inquisition, not to find somebody to shoot, 
but to see what could be learned from from the process. So failure is, is, is very important. If you have just successes, uh, for a, say a string of successes, you tend to get overconfident. You tend to get fat. Uh, it's, it's like growing fast. You, you grow fast, budgets are less important. You want to get the people on board and get them working and your uh, subsidiary or support organizations grow. Then you reach a point where your growth stops and you've got to cut back. And that's very painful. So you learn from that. Any specific failure that stands out that you did not anticipate and you said, wow, this is personally uh, critical in my life that I, I, I made this mistake and I will never make it again kind of thing? Well, I think um, transition, the transition, the big management change was the biggest problem that we encountered in our history. We had good CEOs uh, and it wasn't that and it began in 2005 when I gave up the CEO position, but it wasn't because I was that good a CEO. I had a tremendous team, and and the man that succeeded me, who was at least as capable as I, uh, didn't have as strong a team. So we began to stumble, not not much, but a little bit. And, and that continued on. Then we hired another person who was a good man and honest and hardworking, but he wasn't a good match for our company and he made a big mistake in a major acquisition. And that made it worse. And then in the meantime, the mar market got worse. So that was the biggest challenge in our history. And frankly, we're still recovering from it. Yeah, it, ta it takes several factors for a disaster to happen or things to go wrong. It's not a single single element usually, but you know, uh, when they all come together, that's when you see uh, a disaster. So I think, you know, one needs to realize it's not one single factor ever when we see a failure. Well, we, we never, uh, we were never, a we were never a disaster. We were never close to going out of business. It's just that we had been such a high flying firm. It was sobering to come back down to earth and to realize that we had more defects than some of our competitors. That's but hopefully that's behind us. That's interesting. So what are some of the developmental challenges that in your lifetime you realized that you needed to work on? And um, how did you address those weaknesses? Uh, are you talking about personally or corporate? I'm talking about personally for the purposes of business, not otherwise. Well, <laughs> <laughs> As, as, as I was saying, as a person who is, tendently in, is, is type A kind of guy that works very hard and perhaps worries too much, I always pray for grace so that I can have equanimity in my life. And, and I have a great deal of equanimity uh, in my life, and, um, but frankly, I'm an old geezer and I like more. <laughs> and, and, I, and I pray for courage because we're all tested. Our courage is always tested. And uh, being, being a military man, courage is very important to me. I don't want to be a coward in front of my colleagues, or I, I don't want to let down my family in some manner. I, I want to be courageous at the time. And, and there were times when I uh, acted courageously, and, uh, and I don't remember times where I was a coward, but I never don't want to encounter those times. And as you get older, some you face death. And I want I would like to have grace and courage as, as I approach my death. But sometimes you're you know you're in a hospital and you're under intensive care and you're drugged up and it's a heck of a way to, for your family to see you go. Well uh, I hope you have uh, many, many years ahead of you to give and contribute to the world as you have already done and uh, not to think about uh, passing away, but you know, well, we all do pass away and we will. And I hope, uh, I, I feel the same way, and especially I have asthma, so I'm very fearful of going away without breathing because of lack of breath. So we all have our own fears and yes. work at them. I think to this, the, I think humans, the most healthy people 
we're meant to contribute to society. And I'm at my best when I'm contributing to my family, uh, to our country, and to world society as a whole. And I'm at my best when I'm uh, helping our company to do that. You know, this is such a hard lesson to learn. It takes time, uh, maturity. I wouldn't say time necessarily, but it takes certainly takes maturity. And oftentimes people get matured over the years. But the recognition that once you define a cause bigger than your own self, and when, once you identify purpose that's not selfish, I have found that most of the great leaders are talking about it. When you define your purpose independent of your own self, Success typically tends to follow. Well said. Well, Ernst, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Good talking to you, Nick. You take care. Bye. Bye.